Tom, we can't see your screen just yet. Yep, can see it now. Is that working? Yep. Awesome. Um, if you just want to put it in presenter view. Excellent. Right. Perfect. So, you. Tom you, is going to be our fifth presenter for the day. Uh, and the title of Tom's project is A Practical Investigation into Potential Improvements for Testicular Shielding During Abdominal Radiotherapy. So, Tom, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, well, as Jake said, um, this uh, proposed project is on investigating improvements in testicular shielding, um, specifically during abdominal pelvic um, radiotherapy. So this presentation uh, will be split into four um, parts. The first part will be the background and scientific motivation um, for improving testicular shielding. In other words, why it's important and why we should do it. Uh, the second will talk more nitty gritty into the aims of the project and what it specifically hopes to achieve. Uh, and then how using a five point plan um, that will talk about the different uh, phases more or less of the project. And then I'll talk about the current status of the project and then where it is as of right now. Uh, so in terms of why we want to shield the testicles is because there are three um, threats that can occur if, if the testicles are exposed to radiation. Um, and that is uh, cancer, uh, heritable effects, um, but the one that's most important uh, would be sterility. Um, and that can come in two kinds, uh, oligospermia and azoospermia. Uh, the first of which is just a reduced um, sperm count or can be considered, you know, like a, a temporary loss in fertility. Um, and azoospermia is the, just the absence of living, for, uh, a living uh, spermatozoa. So that's just, you know, uh, sterile effectively. Uh, and both of these can be observed after exposure to high dosage radiation. Um, and uh, this arises from the, uh, the germinal epithelium um, around the testicles uh, and specifically where the site of uh, sperm production is, uh, which is in the um, seminiferous tubules. Um, so it's believed that doses as low as 0.1 gray are enough to alter uh, spermatogonia um, uh, within the seminiferous tubules. Um, and the duration of, of the infertility um, can is highly dependent on the dose, uh, which makes it even more important that the dose is kept as low as possible. Um, and if the testicles are exposed to just less than one grade, temporary azoospermia can occur, but recovery is likely. But with doses between one and five grays, uh, permanent sterility can occur. Uh, and if it does occur, it can take years to, to improve. And so if someone is given cancer at a young age, this can be extremely uh, detrimental to their quality of life. Um, it is recommended that doses obviously be kept as low as possible to the testicles. But generally speaking, the one gray threshold has been given in numerous studies because that is the site at which permanent sterility can occur. So it's like the lowest, um, like it's, it's a very conservative estimate for um, when permanent sterility can occur. And it is thus incredibly important that when uh, the testicles are threatened by radiation, that the dose be kept, you know, less than one gray for that reason. So um, this leads me to my next point, as we know that it's bad effectively to irradiate the testicles for this reason, but when is it a threat? Uh, and that is through, as I mentioned, abdominal pelvic radiotherapy. Um, or at least those are the radiotherapies whereby we may cross that one gray threshold limit. Uh, and that includes the bladder, the prostate, the rectum, and the various um, lower lymph nodes, uh, the paraiotic, homolateral, iliac, and inguinal lymph nodes. Uh, they're all close enough to testicles that the radiotherapy these regions threaten sterility. Um, and it's because of uh, the field to testes distance um, that it is a threat. And so the closer you get to the testicles, the more of a a worry this kind of thing is. Uh, and so this warrants the use of a shield to simply block the radiation from entering the testicles because if it doesn't get into the seminiferous tubules, sterility is not affected, and therefore uh, the patient will not have a unnecessary dose, which is what um, this is all about. Uh, and this is a testicular shield, uh, and it is this that uh, my proposal focuses on. So 
the current state of granite shielding in literature um, is mostly using lead, um, but is this is highly problematic because lead is well known as a hazardous metal and has several uh, health, ergonomics, environmental problems with it. Um, for example, it is detrimental to various body systems um, and it in fact impedes your reproductive systems uh, if it gets into your blood, which is exactly you know, what we're trying to avoid, uh, like sterility, for example. Um, and lead is obviously incredibly heavy and has the ability to like mash fingers and toes if it's in the brick form, which it often is uh, in, in the literature. Um, and so avoid Tom, oh, sorry, you just muted yeah. for a second. Yep. Sorry, uh, mesh fingers and toes, which do tend to be dense in general. Um, and of course, there are uh, environmental issues because lead is classed as a hazardous waste material, and thus it can be expensive to um, dispose of lots of it at once, which do does lead to a small economic argument uh, against it at, at the same time. Um, yeah, so an ideal uh, shield or a desirable shield would be lightweight, biocompatible, cost-effective, and non-toxic, while keyly not sacrificing its ability to be used as an effective attenuator of radiation. So from a top-down point of view, it should be uh, suitable to management. In other words, be inexpensive, portable, and reusable. Uh, it should be ideal for the environment, biodegradable, not hazardous. And importantly, it should be suitable for the patient, as in comfortable, Calming, by that I just mean like not aggressive, like they're not sh you know, shrouded in this really oppressive shield. Um, protective, which is again the most important uh, aim, and non-toxic. Um, so for example, lead, um, if moved around and, and dashed and generally not treated carefully, uh, lead uh, particulates can occur. And you know, if that gets in your clothes and you, you have kids at home and they have mouthing behaviors, well that, that can you know get into their system, which is not at all uh, what we want. Um, so yeah, these ideal quantities are not all going to be realized like at the same time. It's, it's not a, like it doesn't make sense to do all of them. Um, but it is important that we recognize what would be good and then work towards maximizing as many of these as often as possible while still maintaining the effective attenuation properties of whatever shield it is that is selected. So um, that brings me to the chief aims of the project. The aim is to improve upon the status quo in testicular shielding and move away from lead. Uh, the aim then is to find a material with the potential to rival lead in one or more of the aforementioned domains and provide a suitable alternative for specific use in abdominal pelvic radiotherapy. And I say radiotherapy instead of diagnostic imaging because there are a lot of studies that say that there's no point doing a diagnostic imaging um, because uh, it just obscures the image and means you have to take another one, increasing your dose. Um, or with something like the automatic exposure on, it can actually increase uh, dosage um, for reasons that aren't uh, relevant right now. Um, so this would necessarily involve the construction of the shield and then the subsequent evaluation of the effectiveness. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we will need uh, something to test it, which leads me into the, um, the project plan. So. Firstly, there will be a literature review, which will be an analysis of the chemistry and the radiation physics that will design the optimum shield strength. Uh, this is where I'm at right now, and I have uh, a very uh, strong uh, candidate at the moment. Um, but again, this is still ongoing, and there may be something that comes up that will rival um, what I believe. Um, then there'll be the construction of the shield, which will involve purchasing materials of it and the use of the workshop at Charles Gardner Hospital, uh, likely for the reasons I'm going to mention later. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the next part will be designing a phantom. So as mentioned, this will be testing for the testicles. And so that will mean the construction of a phantom of the of a male's pelvis. Um, and this uh, is obviously a site of soft tissue. So for instance, the penis and the testicles are all sites of soft tissue. So in order to, to source a, a uh, 3D print that we could use as a base, it would be ideal if we could use MRI scans because MRIs have a better capability for imaging soft tissue as opposed to CT scans. However, just a precursory look at this now, I've seen that that may be difficult to source because um, most of the available like uh, 3D printing uh, files regarding MRIs tend to be at the head. Um, so this may be an issue, and I really would prefer to stay away from CT scans because of their lack of soft tissue um, imaging. But I understand if, if I will need to be if that um, is not possible. Uh, fourthly, there will be the testing. So 
the testicular shield will be testing a variety of different radiotherapy treatments. So it will be placed on the phantom and then put into all of the different radiotherapy things that could potentially threaten it. Now, this is uh, a lot of different treatments, so it's understandable if we only get one or two done, but ideally I'd like to test as many as possible. So the bladder, the prostate, the rectum, the lymph nodes, and so on. So we'll use uh, the use of a LINAC. Um, and as for dosimeters, I'm leaning closely towards using a TLD um, because I know that they're small and they can be used in, in vivo dosimetry and many um, other studies have had success with it. But I recognize that the high uncertainty may not be ideal, particularly when dealing with a one gray uh, threshold limit. Like if the acidity increases to levels where it's like almost, you know, you're not getting any information, it may be better to, to use something else like film or an ion chamber. Um, and film may be considered anyway due to the entrance and exit dose. But at this point, TLD, I think, is the, uh, the winner. Um, and finally, there will be the analysis and conclusion of the effectiveness. So that will be determined primarily using a number known as the shielding factor, which is the dose with and without the shield. So during the testing phase, we test it without the shield, we test it with the shield, and then we effectively compare how good it is and then compare that to the current literature of uh, shielding factors for other materials, for example. Although, if time permits, I would like to test it with um, lead or a lead blanket or something as a benchmark to try and see just, you know, does my design improve upon lead uh, in any uh, physically quantitative way? Uh, and this is a diagrammatic description of what I was talking about. So phase one, literature review. Phase two, construction. Phase three, phantom design and construction. Phase four, testing. Phase five, analysis and conclusion and write-up. Okay, um, so the current status of where I am right now is with this one particular material that uh, has had a pilot study only a few years ago uh, and only a few papers have been talking about it, but it seems uh, very interesting, uh, at least as a um, opponent to lead. Um, so it's a um, nanotechnology effectively. So it involves using powdered nanotungsten trioxide and nanotin dioxide at a ratio of 15 to 85% mixed in an epoxy paint matrix um, and then sprayed and then tested like that. So the pilot study um, used uh, killer electron volt beams, which is not um, the, the uh, kind of uh, energy spectrum that we'll be dealing with with radiotherapy. We'll be dealing with much higher energies. Um, and so it seems prudent that if we were to use something like this, uh, we'd have to combine it with something else, which I'll get to. Um, so yeah, um, it was found that uh, nanoparticles in general, by other papers, have found that um, uh, when the dimensions of the particle, so that the particle is in the nano size, more attenuation is achieved. So in other words, when photons come towards nanoparticles, uh, more attenuation is achieved than with the same particle of a larger size. Uh, and tungsten already in its elemental form has strong capabilities as a shield, but due to its expense and it's still you know, incredibly dense, so you're not really fixing that ergonomic kind of problem with lead as touched on earlier. So this would be almost getting the benefit of tungsten while also having something that's much more uh, you know, lightweight, ergonomic, easy to use and so on. However, I recognize the energy spectrum is not ideal. Uh, and so that's when uh, I thought that it'd be a good idea to combine this with serosafe. So other papers have used the cerebend, which is otherwise known as Wood's metal, which has a really low melting point that when taken around a mold, some, some papers use the coconut uh, to shield around. Um, then, uh, what's the word? That would, had lots of success, in other words. Um, so then if I were to use cerosafe, uh, which doesn't have the toxic vapors and fumes associated with cerebend, and then uh, paint that around with this um, potential um, shield paint effectively, I would be able to get, um, what's the word, the benefit of the um, paint while still making sure that it is in an energy range that is ideal um, and having something that's structurally secure. Because either way, if you're going to use the paint, you're going to need something that's actually going to affix itself uh, to the body or at least be comfortable to use for the patient. Uh, it is this design that I'm most interested primarily in pursuing. But there are other candidates at this point in time, but um, I feel like this one is the strongest to, to go with right now. And it is this one that I am looking at testing ideally. So this presentation covered uh, the background of scientific motivation for improving testicular shielding. In other words, the biological motivation and the radiotherapy motivation. 
uh, the aims of what I want to do and what will need to be found for this to be considered a successful study. Uh, then I went into the nitty gritty of how exactly I want to do that with my five point plan. And then I mentioned the current status of the shielding material that I think uh, is the, the, the most likely candidate. Uh, and I will point out that uh, the, the, the first phase, the literature review and finding of the results uh, will be completed by the end of December, ideally, uh, as I want to maximize the amount of time I've got to order, obviously, products in, uh, should I need to. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Tom, for that great presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Tom? Martin, go for it. Thank you, Tom. Um, you mentioned at the start uh, that the shields <coughs> are used um, Basically, you're shielding the actual primary beam itself. Um, is that the main contribution to the dose? Like, are there, so, are there other sources? Yeah, yeah. So um, the idea is to put the, the the shield around the person and then test them in clinical conditions. Sorry if that wasn't clear. So that means that I wouldn't act. Well, I'm, I wouldn't be shielding. Uh, sorry, I wouldn't be putting the beam directly on the testicles themselves. I'd be putting it on where the bladder or the prostate or the rectum or whatever would be, and then the scatter would be primarily um, the biggest contributor of the dose. I mean, I could test directly onto it to see, you know, exactly how effective it is, and I probably will do that anyway if time allows, so that I can get a better number that's more comparable to other literature. But uh, it is in my opinion, better to test um, the prostate and the rectum and so on like that, and then just see, okay, in a clinical condition, what would that be like if an actual person was wearing this? Because fundamentally, I would use people if there were not, you know, ethical and obvious logistic concerns and so on. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no volunteers. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, the, that's a perfect answer. Um, I think one of the other sources is leakage from the treatment head itself. Uh, it's, it's probably minor, but you might want to just quantify that and compare it to the scatter. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's a really good idea. It would be good if I had a actual description of every single um, point at which the dose would occur um, for better analysis effectively. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Tom, sorry, I, I may have missed it, but what um, dosimeter were you planning on using to, to measure the dose? Oh, sorry, so, um, that was a point of contention. So my current idea is to use a, a TLD, a thermoluminescent dosimeter, um, because they are small. Uh, other studies have had success using them, um, placing them at the uh, edges and in between, like the scrotal sac. Um, uh, and the ideal there is because, again, they're small. Uh, we've got Royal Perth, um, uh, which can uh, read them, uh, and uh, what's the word? Um, they've, they've been well known as an in vivo dissimilar. However, I, I do recognize that they have a high uncertainty, which may be problematic because, again, I'm looking at a one gray threshold limit. So if that's, you know, if the uncertainty is like, you know, 0.5 gray, 0 0.8 you know, gray, you know, then it's like, well, I, I can't really realistically estimate anything from that. So if close to the day it turns out that whatever dissimilar I want to use specifically has a high uncertainty, it may be better to, to ditch it in, in favour of film or an ion chamber. However, that would be, you know, annoying because of the uh, odd shape of, of the scrotal sac um, and uh, the, the small size effectively, because it would be maybe difficult to put an ion chamber exactly where I want to be in the seminiferous tubules. And because of the, the film, it's it would be fine for entrance dose, but I really want to know the dose specifically inside the testicle. Um, so that's why film isn't really ideal. And, and that's why I've settled on TLD, and I'd rather not have to shy away from it if I if I can get away with it. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. If there's no other questions, then I think we'll uh, we'll leave it there because we're slightly behind time. Um, so, Tom, again, thanks for the fantastic presentation. I'll stop no recording here.